You're tuned in to Reimagine 2021, version 11, the number one virtual crypto and blockchain conference. In this next segment, our speakers talk about what creators have to gain from NFTs. Well, these um, NFTs, going back to the Picasso thing, high-end you know, mm-hmm. value of art, or whatever the case is, whatever the item is, fractionalization versus yep. owning outright. And this kind of can go different ways. We can talk about it on, on an art piece. Uh, we could talk about it kind of on the uh, uh, like crypto punk you know, yeah. style, yeah. right? Or, yeah. or that kind of stuff. Yeah. How do you see fractionalization um, versus buying it outright? And I guess it depends on who the person is. So, so fractionalization is no different than what we do with, with investments today. Like if you think about, I'm buying a share of Tesla, well, what does that mean? I'm buying a fractional ownership of Tesla. It just happens to be a whole share. There's no reason why I wouldn't buy half a share or a quarter share, et cetera. So that concept exists. Well, what if I took an airplane and I fractionalized that and you own it? Well, yeah, we already have fractional ownership of airplanes, but we could tokenize that. So I don't think fractionalization in and of itself is anything new or novel, right? I do think that when it comes to NFTs, you can create fractionalized NFTs. That's okay, the registry can handle that. I think it goes back to what kind of NFT are we talking about? And I said, there's different use cases. I think digitally native stuff will, tra- will, will act one way. I think at the other end of the spectrum, you'll have stuff that, you know, like some of the punks and so on. I would, I would liken that to more like fast fashion. You buy it, you use it for a while, you get bored with it, you throw it away, you buy another one, right? I mean, I think that's what's gonna happen. Do you think NFTs support the long tail on the other side of, of artists and, and, and musicians? And- yeah, look, if I was an artist or musician, I think the NFT is one of the greatest things ever invented because it, it lets me lock in not only ownership, but a royalty stream, which I currently cannot do in the, in, in the physical world. Like yeah. if I'm an artist and I create a piece of art in the physical world and I sell it, once I sell it, I'm done. Yeah. I have no more economic claim on that thing, it's gone. Whereas with an NFT, I can have an economic claim on it no matter what happens. And so, you know, if something quadruples or quintuples in value, I at least participate on the upside. And I think for an artist, that's an amazing thing. And they should. Just that digital aspect of, of land, real estate, whatever that is. And I think NFTs lay that economic like infrastructure to actually now you can own something, right? Right, right now it's in the game or it's kind of stuck. NFTs are bringing that out a little bit. And then I, I feel like this is just one, you know, laying the track down for, for the metaverse, the tracks within these metaverses to actually own something. Um, right now we kind of own it on a centralized, you know, aspect and, and that's kind of opening up. The other day it was updated that uh, Adobe is now involved um, partnering or, or having an option on their on their software do you want to edit do you want to make this an nft and it's really allowing the creator to input um in the metadata their social you know their their, their social uh, media stuff not only that the content like certification that's right. kind of a good sign right it's a good sign and it makes a lot of sense right because you have the creator software that can now be combined with the smart contract software so that NFT is basically the equivalent of having a unique serial number with a digital signature, that's a dig- digital signature that says, I own this. Well, why not have the software that I used to create it, put it in there at the same time and create a token that represents the ownership in what I just created yeah. that I can immediately send out into the crypto sphere. Do you think NFTs are a sustainable path for uh, content creators or will it be the 1% that acquire all this value? You know, I think there's a really big long tail for creators today. You have platforms like Patreon and Cameo and others where you have a few people that really rose to the top uh, and they're generating the most revenue from the content that they're creating. Um, I think that you're always going to have content creators, uh, some of them being more popular than others and gaining more attention and traction and then a very big long tail. But there's this idea that if you have in a creator economy, uh, even just a hundred fans paying a hundred dollars a month, if they're considered like extreme fans, then that's a sustainable living for someone. And so, if you're using uh, if you're using uh, crypto technology and you're minting NFTs, 
and you have hardcore fans that are interested in participating and supporting you and you're able to give them something unique that's digital, I think that it's definitely incentive for them to want to, um, to, want to participate and to want to purchase your creations. There's an application on Hedera called Galaxy. It stands for the Creator's Galaxy. And uh, it's uh, created by the NBA star Spencer Dinwiddie and our old developer evangelist Cooper Coons actually works there as their CTO. And they're allowing creators to jump on the platform. They can mint NFTs for their fans. Uh, they can have fans subscribe to them for a monthly fee and they receive unique digital assets. And as for things like shout outs and videos and uh, all of these different ways of engaging with creators. And so I think we're going to see more applications like that and more uh, creative ways for people to be able to engage with these people. I think NFTs is the opposite for the 1%. I do think that for, uh, as, I, uh, as I mentioned before, for, for the 1%, for these amazing blue chip artists, it's going to be a completely new, different way for them to explore their artistic concepts and for them to be able to communicate with their audiences. Uh, Ty, for example, you know, we walked him through Discord, which is like such a such a novel concept to explain to someone who uh, has never seen Discord before. And he was so fascinated by like, the 24 seven ongoing conversation that's going on. He's like, you know, I have like I have millions of followers on uh, Doing in China, but they're not talking to each other the way that these communities are about my art. And it's so amazing to see that continuous flow of conversation. I think that NFTs are ultimately to support new creators who have had no audiences. Uh, I recently collected an amazing work by a French uh, artist, uh, Raphael Urba. And you know he's a dad uh, living in Lyon with his daughter and just a digital artist and animator who was inspired by his daughter and created a series around her. And before NFTs, he had never been able to get any attention to his work. And I think there's so many other stories of artists like this where NFTs is how they're first making a living. NFTs are how people are getting to know them and discover their artwork. I think before, you know, you wouldn't go on a digital marketplace to look for artworks because you would think, you know, what's the difference between me owning this um, amazing image when someone else can just download it in the same exact quality? But now with NFTs, there's provenance. So there's, uh, you know that you're the collector, you know that this is the creator, and there's a really clear track of where this artwork has been and the story that it then tells. I think also this is where collectors in the space began to play a huge part in supporting these up and coming artists where uh, recently Sotheby's had an amazing sell called Natively Digital about uh, that was a collection of collectors who each selected some of their works to uh, then be auctioned off as NFTs. And I think what's so crazy about it is that these collectors, you know, are supporting artists who no one has known about before previously. And now they're able to make millions off of their work and really be proud of the fact and identify as an artist. Look, early movers always have a huge advantage. Uh, you know, my pinned tweet on Twitter is the greatest wealth is created by investing in something that you believe in before others even understand. And you'll be mocked and ridiculed and, and those early adopters of whether it was NFTs or whether it's cryptocurrency were certainly mocked and ridiculed. Uh, first they were ignored actually, then they were laughed at. Now, now they're going to fight against us and ultimately, you know, we've already won. But I do think that in the NFT world, the early movers, the creators that it embraced it have a huge advantage, but it's going to permeate throughout all of the creator economy. You know, why is it right that a centralized authority that wrote some code five, six, seven years ago takes all of the value created? Take the gaming world, right? Fortnite, everybody plays it, it's free, quote unquote, but then the money goes in and Epic Games makes a ton of money. Or my son and I play Pokemon Go and Niantic makes a lot of money from me buying remote raid passes. Axie Infinity flips that model on his head and says, hey, the community can share in those revenues that go in. So uh, as the creator economy expands, as more people have more time to be creative, one of the nice things about cryptocurrency is it's a deflationary asset 
as opposed to an inflationary asset. If you get paid in fiat, every day that you hold it, you're getting less rich, right? They're stealing your wealth back through this thing called inflation. And they perpetuated this lie that, that somehow we should value inflation, that should be a goal. It's actually a horrible thing. It's really good for the 1%, to your point. The people at the top of the pyramid get richer and richer as that wealth siphons up. What a deflationary currency like crypto does is it appreciates in time because it's digitally scarce. And so you can have your wealth stored in an appreciating asset, and then you can spend more time being creative. And Jimmy Song talks a lot about this and does a better job uh, than I will. But uh, it's a really exciting element of, of the whole transition from the electronic world to the digital world. I think it is sustainable. It might still have the same issues as other innovations in the past where you have the separation of ultra wealthy and, and, and not, right? I think that's just kind of what happens, especially with these types of technologies. Because if you have early adopters, most of the time the early adopters aren't people that are risking their whole life savings on things. I mean, there obviously are some people that do that, but the people that are able to, to experiment, participate in these highly, more, I guess, riskier asset classes usually have a lot of money in the bank effectively. So I think you'll always see that kind of, um, I guess, uh, separation of, of wealth. But I think the thing that's really important to note is the barrier to entry into the technology. That's what's really fascinating. Anyone can come in today, so long as they can cover the, the gas costs, I guess, and depending on which platform you use, so long as you can cover those costs, you can actually mint your own set of collections, or maybe you can mint your own set of use, set of use cases, um, property rights, those things that we were mentioning earlier. I mean, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't support, you know, long t everybody, right, that's getting involved. I mean, we're seeing news of um, teenagers launching NFTs and, and making a, a, a splash, right? So typically when you look at um, the blockchain technology or cryptocurrencies, they, they get rid of the middlemen, right? They make it more efficient, they make it faster. And so there's no reason why that should accumulate all to the 1% of uh, content or art creators. I think there will be a room for everyone to get involved. And that's the power of decentralization, right? So someone sitting in New York has the same access as someone sitting in Bangladesh, let's say, right? So like it really opens up the world to everyone. And, um, and that's what excites me the most about just decentralization in general on the finance side, on the NFT side. We'll see participation globally in this, in this economy. I think a lot more creators need to think about this as a sustainable and long-term kind of thing. Obviously, there's this incredible euphoria and people making money, you know, more money than they probably ever could have hoped for doing what they're doing. Um, but that's like a, such a small percentage of the market. And I think for like the rest of the world, a lot of which are still shut out, there is opportunity to come in and play. And I think Hick at Nunk and like platforms that are on sidechains kind of show and display this. Um, you know, you have artists who are selling work for a dollar, two dollars free in some cases and making just as much money as the artists selling one of ones on Ethereum. And those are the stories that you don't really hear a lot about. Um, and, you know, I think as time goes on and more and more platforms kind of are able to improve their infrastructure, make fees more uh, accessible and, and like available to people and even have people not have to have crypto experience to participate in this space. Um, I think we'll see a lot more innovation around the sustainability. But no, I don't think the, the rate we're going right now is sustainable. I think there'll always be a place for fine art. I think most PFPs will be worthless within as soon as a year. Um, but I, I do think that like art, collectibles, gaming, like all these different things that are building community around NFTs with long-term visions, not roadmaps, but like concrete visions. Um, I think those are the things that will be around and you can still make such an incredible like life for yourself, sustaining yourself, selling your NFTs for like reasonable prices and actually building a brand from your NFTs as opposed to just focusing on niche collectors and people who will probably disappear when the value disappears. Okay, so like generally talking about NFTs, um, like it's like we're kind of moving a bit out of China. Um, I really like, okay, the concept of the smart contract, of course. So obviously NFT is in a smart contract. You can put whatever parameters you want in there. And so I think a really cool thing that to make it more equitable is you can do patronage. 
so like it's like say you have like Beeple like so I don't know however many millions of dollars like Beeple sold you know, like you know his NFTs for or their NFTs for um, but like you could put that in a smart contract and X amount can go to like a fund and they can fund like up and coming artists whether they be like in emerging markets or any market right there kind of give people the ability to like you know, beyond a day job or something like that, the ability to pursue a passion, you know, via a smart contract that goes into a fund and then people apply to this fund perhaps and they can, you know, follow their passions. Do you think NFTs are a sustainable path for creators to monetize? Yeah, I think so. It's a new vehicle for them. It works and that's very straightforward, direct, no middleman. So yeah, a lot of artists made a lot of money for last year, so it's very really cool to see how they just get rich at some point, <laughs> uh, trading on Rarible or other marketplaces. Do you think NFTs give creators uh, new identities? For sure, uh, and I mean, for Tier Lab, we are focused on the traditional art world first and foremost, and our first drop was with gunpowder artist Tai Guo Tiang. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time focusing on education with traditional artists as they come on to uh, the NFT space. And for Tai, what was immediately compelling to him was the idea of freezing time with before uh, all of Tai's previous works were the results of his explosions. You know, they were absolutely beautiful, but he was never able to capture the moment of explosion and the moment of birth of his artworks. And so he utilized NFTs as a way to kind of uh, he called it trans, uh, transient eternity to cement that on the blockchain and to capture a moment in time that wasn't possible before. So I think conceptually, it offers a lot of new creative insights for artists that have not approached NFTs before. And then I think for other digital artists, you know, it really opens up a whole new world where they never had the opportunities to be able to focus on and create their own works that were not commissioned or uh, not based upon you know, what someone else may have wanted, what a client's work may have wanted. I was in a conversation with one of our artists uh, for our current drop, AI2441, Ash Thorpe, this morning. And Ash is an amazing artist. He's actually one of Beeple's close friends. And Beeple was who introduced him to the NFT space. And he was telling us about how, to him, it was just such a strange concept to be able to sell his own art, uh, his own digital art, and have collectors appreciate it and grow with him because that was something that was never possible before with the kind of work that he created. So for these up and coming artists, where do you think the value derives from uh, compared to traditional art that uh, has a more, more of a track record? I think that it just completely breaks that track. Uh, in the traditional art world, uh, I think there's a pretty set path to success in terms of, you know, you have to get signed to the right gallery. You have to have the right collectors have your work. You have to have the right exhibitions at the right museums at the right time. And a lot of that adds up. Uh, whereas I think NFTs is now, now where, you know, people might just be scrolling on Twitter. I've discovered a lot of these amazing artists on Twitter and Instagram and just um, first become visually interested and then and then I look into their background and read their stories that are so easily accessible online because of their online presence. I think the other thing that's really attractive is uh, something that isn't widely available in the traditional art world, which is direct uh, communication with artists. Most of the traditional artists I had the pleasure of knowing, you know, they have very limited time on their hands and they're only able to really see their collectors, like 20 to 30 top collectors in person once or twice a year. And now with Discord and with these newer, younger, digitally native artists being so active, um, I like to point to Ness Graphics. I think he's always done an amazing job uh, rewarding his community members and keeping people interested in his work. Uh, they're on Discord 24 seven. They're answering questions from collectors, like instead of needing to you know, send an email, hoping for a response and maybe needing to spend like a couple hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to get to know an artist that I love. Now I can just send them a DM on Discord or send them a message in their Discord server and get immediate access to them. And I think that's something that the younger generation is really looking for and was really lacking in the traditional art world. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, less roadblocks, they can just go directly to the top. And of course, there's always open uh, d distribution. Do you believe that 
uh, NFTs create a more equitable market? I think yes and no. I think, I think what's going to happen long term with a lot of the digital artists that we're seeing is that ultimately there needs to be scarcity around their work. And if you get in, or like with anything, you, if you get in early enough, you will probably get things at um, a more friendly price. But as they continue developing their works, as they continue releasing beautiful drops, their artworks are only going to appreciate in value. So I think that for NFTs in the long run, it might be harder for people who are coming in at a later stage. However, at the same time, I think that there's so many new artists coming in, not just traditional artists who you know have created art in the physical world, but also new digital artists. Uh, there's this girl who messaged me, she's 14, and she's like created so many NFTs, and it's absolutely amazing. So all together with those, I think that the opportunity then comes for, you know, uh, when you're coming into the space for the first time, you usually are following a drop. And if you're able to get in on that, it then opens up the gateway to learning about other artists and other artworks. But I also think that I, I feel very fortunate to be early on enough on the cusp of something great where prices are not super, super insane yet for a lot of the artists that I love and I want to support. But I definitely see that trend starting to happen with a lot of fantastic artists who, you know, their, their buyers are just so hungry for their work that it's getting really hard for someone who has a limited budget to be able to collect them. What's your take on NFTs in gaming? I mean, people are earning incomes and, and being able to support their families and really you know, buy homes, I think, in certain regions of the world and, and make a living out of it. Right. So like, does this, the NFTs kind of open up another avenue for you know, these individuals? No, I think so. I think, I mean, I think the biggest example is like X Infinity, right? Like, I think it has really taken off as like kind of gaming with NFT component to it. And there's like a lot of folks from Philippines, like Southeast Asian countries who are like literally making more than salary off of these games and making, you know, pretty big in their yeah. kind of world standard. Um, so I do think the NFTs in general have a lot of connection with uh, games in general. And I think that's what a lot of people are ultimately like trying to envision, right? Like a metaverse, which is kind of, I think I'll say like the most similar thing these days are games right now. Uh, so like Fortnite would be a good example. And then to those games or metaverse, you kind of you know have these NFTs that represent yourselves in these games or metaverse digital world, right? It's almost like Ready Player One where you have like basically your character, all these different items are basically NFTs. Um, so I do think there's a lot of different uh, common links. Um, that being said, there haven't been as many successful use cases we've seen, but I'm sure like a lot of them are being built right now. How, how do you see NFTs sort of disrupting uh, the workforce or, or sort of changing the dynamics of, of the workforce, like how creators are, are earning money? Look, I think one thing that we've seen in this pandemic is uh, people spending time, more and more time online and realizing that they can put their skills and their time to all these different use cases in, in terms of earning income. And so the digital economy as a whole is growing and we've seen uh, the, the physical businesses shutting down like restaurants and stores and retail, but the online world is booming and people have realized that there's just so much potential and the future is going to be digital. So that's definitely given a lot more growth and, and momentum to folks working from home or figuring out different avenues of, of earning money and earning an, earning an income, which has boosted this, this kind of explosion of trading. Even like if you look at the, the volumes that have been trading in the last um, couple of months, during the pandemic, they've been kind of breaking records. And there's a reason for that, because people were not outside doing what they were normally doing, socializing. And so with more time being spent at home, they're interacting more with products and services of the digital world and realizing that they could have a lot of income coming out of that. And so we're seeing impacts of that even in the, in the economy. Talking to small business owners here in New York, you'll find that you know, it's hard to find uh, workers to fill different positions. And you know, it's definitely had a big impact on, on the economy, I'd say, in the last year. So we have disruption, but how do NFTs create a more equitable market? That's an excellent question. To be honest, I don't know if they necessarily do. Every marketplace that you're in, every organization, every community has some sort of barrier to entry. Most of those barriers to entry are pretty low, and so it's pretty easy for newcomers, people just random Joe on the street, to jump them and, and get into the community. For example, <clears throat> just the know-how 
of how to use a crypto wallet is a barrier to entry. It's one of the biggest problems in crypto adoption is teaching people what is a crypto wallet, why do you care, how do you use it correctly and safely. And so <clears throat> that level of education is super, super important to be able to make an equitable playing field. In addition to that, there, you have to have some level of disposable income just to purchase an ETH. You have to have some level of disposable income to be able to invest, buy, and collect these NFTs. As a result, you're already creating this barrier to entry. Now, what it does do to make things way more equitable is instead of putting the hands and the power in the very, very high-end gallery-based art scene, you know, your Christie's and your Sotheby's, I think is the other one. I'm not in that scene, so forgive me if I make a mistake there. Um, you're putting it in the hands of the community. They're the ones, all of them, who get to participate and say, this is more valuable than that. And everybody can bid. I don't have to show a bank account balance of 10,000 plus dollars to gain entry into this marketplace. And that's where it's really valuable, right? That's where we're actually creating an equitable playing field is once you get over that minor barrier to entry, setting up your wallet, buying some ETH, buying whatever the denomination is in, once you get there, you can participate in the most expensive auctions to the cheapest auctions. If you're a creator, you don't need a middleman. You can go straight to the marketplace and put your wares up for sale. Uh, and we're already seeing it, right? I mean, a creator can be anywhere. And, and look, all the lockdowns related to COVID taught us about work from anywhere and produce from anywhere. Uh, and the digital world allows that and enables that. And we've had lots of tools that have, have been created uh, to facilitate that. But what I think NFTs does is it, again, allows a creator to own that asset and own the rights to that asset over longer periods of time and to program in a way to get a long tail stream of value, uh, either a, a, an artist, right, from every time his song, his or her song is played, uh, the writer, right, who have been long kind of, I won't say robbed, but, but not paid equitably for their contribution to, to music can, can now have a, a royalty stream in the future. So I, I do think that it, it pushes the sharing down to the decentralized masses. And I think that's the, the whole nature of decentralized versus centralized. Centralized, the whole world has been centralized for years. It's been hierarchical structures trying to leverage the brain of the CEO and all the wealth pushes up. So why, why does the CEO make 460 times more than the laborers, which are producing the value that the CEO is taking through stock options and all the accounting gimmickry that goes on? So decentralization democratizes value and it gives everyone a chance to be part of a community, to be part of an ecosystem and to share in the, the spoils of that labor. And yeah, again, uh, Axie Infinity to me is a, is a great example, uh, not an NFT per se, but the idea of a digital asset that is scarce that uh, in this play to earn economy, instead of a centralized authority taking all the wealth, uh, the owners of the axes can share in that wealth. And so you have stories of you know, migrant laborers in the Philippines who were making you know, pennies an hour, uh, now making thousands of dollars a month, their life is better for this community participation. And you think if that person then feels comfortable having uh, a life where they can spend more time being creative, they can enter the NFT economy and create things of value that can be shared uh, across the whole ecosystem. So I do think it, it pushes the ownership of, va of creativity or the value that we all create every day, right? Our whole life is about converting energy to value. We get up in the morning, we fuel our bodies, we try to be creative or innovative or productive, whether we're making widgets, whether we're pushing around paper, or whether we're you know, moving around financial assets or, or physical assets. It's about converting energy to value. And now there is a way to monetize that conversion of energy to value 
in the digital property rights world or the NFT world. How do you think this disruption, you know, how do you think content creators are going to disrupt centralized media? Content creators have really been trying to fight that exact problem even before Web3, in my opinion. I remember, uh, I think Macklemore must have been one of the early musicians who was able to hit like number one spot on Billboard or something without the backing of a, a major label. And I think many more artists have, have, have kind of achieved that at this point. That was kind of step one, right? They're saying, okay, well, we don't actually have to go to the same four or five labels that have that much power. We can actually bootstrap it with community using just kind of going direct to the people. But of course, it's a, a little bit more difficult and it's a little bit of a bigger risk. Do you think some of, some of these assets, these NFT assets are like a store of value, like you know, yeah. on, on the crypto side, as we think of Bitcoin as right. a store of value, maybe it's transactional, or we trying right, to figure right, that out. Right, right. And then you have NFTs that have robust communities, right, and, right. and contributors and participation. Right. Um, and you mentioned kind of flexing a little bit. Is it more of you know a store of value that, that they think an investment? Yeah, I think so. I think I kind of think of like NFT as like it's a like non fungible token. I mean that that's like that that's the unique token that's only in existence. So it's interesting where you know if you think of Bitcoin, it kind of start as off with this kind of store of value narrative, and then there's like multiple layer ones like Icon and like you know Solana, etc. And then now there's like segment of people who believe in these each ecosystem. And what's interesting is actually you see NFT projects from all these different ecosystems where each of these kind of represent your identity. So it's like almost like kind of break down into like, you know, a whole lot of crowds who live in this store of value narrative, kind of breaking down into small ecosystem who believe that this ecosystem is worth of value. And then breaking that even further down to one person who would think of this NFT as like identity or like has like a, some sort of store of value. So yes, uh, to answer your question, um, I do think some of these NFTs are kind of uh, evolving into this kind of store value narrative, especially something like punks, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and <clears throat> store value, buying thing, you know, buying NFTs, buying these assets, investing in it, having some kind of connection to it. What about like, and you're an NFT holder, so it's a good question to ask, fractionalization versus like buying the whole thing. Right, right. Like how, how do you, how does one feel like if you uh, buy a piece of it, you know, do you feel like you're an owner, you know, buying, uh, the, you know, buying it outright. Um, how do you see kind of fractionalization in terms of maybe inclusivity or, you know, allowing access for kind of the greater uh, retail, you know, investor or, or um, individual that wants to get in? Yeah, so I think um, fractionalization is actually an interesting cost and there are a few projects in the space that are working on the fractionalization of uh, NFTs in general. I do think at least right now, most users kind of want to own the entire piece in general, uh, whether that's like to show off as a, your identity uh, in digital space or to even, you know, like, I don't know, show it as like art perhaps in their, on your own like home or art gallery. Um, I think fractionalization is interesting in the sense that like for ultra rare pieces, like it enables regular people to have access to it, which is great in concept but then that also makes non-fungibility almost like a bug, not a yeah. feature actually. Yeah. Uh, but you know, if you think about it, there's a reason why like the non-fungible tokens are different from regular tokens because it's like the only unique token that one person can hold. So um, it's we may see some more demand for it, um, but I don't think I've seen anything so far. Um, at least I think the current demographics of NFT holders or who are looking for NFTs are not the demographics of these fractionalized NFTs right now.